If you've been watching my channel for a while, then you know that something I'm really interested in is the science of learning a language. And recently I had the pleasure of talking to Stephen Piantadosi, who is the head of the Computation and Language Lab at UC Berkeley. We talked about language acquisition and how children learn vocabulary and artificial intelligence. It was a really fascinating conversation and I hope you enjoy it. Stephen Piantadosi, thanks so much for, for joining me today. Sure, happy to be here. For, for people who, who don't know you and your work, could you just talk a little bit about like what you do, really? Sure, yeah. So. Uh... Most of the people in the lab are, are interested in understanding learning and uh, learning very broadly. So, you know, how, how can you build, for instance, learning models or, or uh, artificial intelligence systems that can learn like people do? Um, and we take that usually to, to involve uh, figuring out how people do learning and, uh, you know, what kinds of mechanisms they have, how they handle data, what kinds of things they pay attention to in the world. Um, uh, what kinds of theories people consider when they're trying to understand some new system. Um, and we work a lot on, on understanding language learning and uh, early mathematics learning. So um, uh, trying to make sense of uh, the kinds of representations that, that adults have and how kids could start with whatever they start with, whatever a, you know, a, a newborn baby starts with and arrive at the kinds of representations that uh, adults find very, very ordinary and easy to handle. I have yeah. to congratulate you um, because recently you published a paper um, uh, which showed that all of language that, that humans know would fit on a floppy disk. About 1.5 <laughs> megabytes of, of information. And, and I, I saw this paper everywhere. I saw it on BBC News. <laughs> I saw it on Facebook. I saw it on Reddit. So congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, we, we, we had been uh, thinking about this question for a, a while in the lab of trying to quantify exactly how much people know. Um, and the reason for that is that there's a lot of debates that uh, originated both in linguistics and philosophy and early psychology about how much information has to be built in for learners. So um, how much, like, what exactly is different between a human and another primate that allows a human to learn language and not another primate, or between a human and a hamster, right, that allows a human to learn language and not a hamster. So um, there's... Uh, uh, lo lots of argument about that, but n nobody had gone through and sort of quantified exactly how much information people had to learn. Um, and that's something that you can do by uh, looking at the, the, the types of knowledge that adults have and trying to, to kind of estimate. We did these kind of back of the envelope calculations to try to estimate uh, how much information learners would have had to extract from their environment in order to uh, arrive at the, the, the amount of knowledge that, that adults have about English. In the paper, um, it has a string of ones and zeros. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and it shows that a person, you know, from, from, from the time they're born until they're 18 years old, they would have to learn a sequence like this every single day for 18 years to, to yeah. acquire a language. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, the, the, the estimates that, that we come up with are, are on the order of, of hundreds to, to thousands of, of bits of information per day. So that's hundreds or thousands of ones and zeros, you have to remember. And uh, if, if you look at, you know, 200 ones and zeros, it looks like a huge amount of, of information to remember. And I think that that's right. It is a huge amount. Um, the format of representation for learners is, of course, different than a string of ones and zeros. I mean, they're, uh, the things that they're learning are... Um, more naturally connected to uh, the, the words that they know, word meanings, different syntactic constructions, different speech sounds. And so there's, uh, there's basically, um, you know, cognitive mechanisms for handling those and for, for encoding information like that. But the total amount of information that, that those mechanisms are able to extract from the world is, I think, surprisingly large. It's interesting what you said before about you know, it would be very difficult for a human to just learn ones and zeros every single day, but it's, it would be much easier to learn the same amount of information if it was like encoded in maybe a story or something. So, sure, so, yeah. so what, what, what does that maybe tell us about, about the language learning process? Um, does it tell us anything interesting about, about that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that there are certain things which are, are very natural for people to learn. There, there are certain pathways which we're very good at, at absorbing information in. Um, uh, for instance, if I, if I showed you a picture, uh, I could ask you in a week, if I could show it to you again in a week and ask you if it was the same one, and you'd probably be pretty good at, at recognizing it. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I encoded that picture as a string of zeros and ones, you know, even though the information might be equivalent, uh, in a week, a week later, you probably wouldn't be able to remember <laughs> what you know, whether you had seen that, that sequence of zeros and ones. And so just psychologically, there's some formats which are very natural um, and some which are unnatural. And um, one of the actually main findings of, of the paper is that um, uh, most of that information, almost all of that information is about word meanings. So it's what uh, different nouns and, and verbs uh, refer to in the world. It's about their, their semantics or their dictionary definitions or, or some, some kind of, of representations of their meaning. Um, and I think actually that, that that's one of the formats where people are, are very, very good at, um, uh, at, at encoding new amounts, new, new chunks of information, basically. Right. So I, I could teach you a, a, a new word uh, in a single sentence and, and um, you know, you'd pr be able to remember it for some amount of time. And um, uh, the, the amount of information that, that is required for a single word is, is non-trivial. I mean, it's um, um, depending on, on how you estimate, right, it's, it's maybe a, a, a couple hundred bits of information that specifies exactly what the word picks out. So, so for example, if, if I was learning a language and I had maybe two options for, for learning vocabulary, I could sort of sit down with a list maybe of, of 20 words for that day and, and just try to remember those 20 words. Or I could maybe, you know, is there, is there a better way? Does, does your research show that there would be a better way to remember those words? I don't know. So um, I, I think that sitting down and memorizing a list is certainly different than how children do it, uh -huh. right? So, so they're, they're probably picking out pieces of meaning from multiple situations that they in, encounter in the world. Uh -huh. And um, that means that there's, you know, there, I, I guess I think of it as, as them starting with uh, very fuzzy concepts or very fu fuzzy word meanings. And as they go around and acquire information, those hone in and they figure out exactly what, uh, exactly what words mean. So they, you know, first might think an uncle is just a male, then they might think, oh, you know, an uncle is actually uh, some kind of older relative who's a male. Um, and then over time, they'll figure out, oh, no, it's actually an older male relative who's, uh, you know, a sibling of, of one of your parents. Um, and so that, that kind of refinement of, of concepts is, is something that I think happens very naturally in, in ordinary language learning. Um, I, I don't know... Uh, I don't know enough about, say, second language learning or language learning in adults to, to know exactly what the, the best kind of uh, method for, for teaching and, and learning might be there. So okay. it, it, might, it easily could be the case, for instance, that um, you know, adults could sit down every day and, and learn a couple of words a day just by reading word lists or, or, or reading from, from the dictionary. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's certainly not, not what kids do. But based on your, on your work with, with children, and, you know, especially, for example, we were talking about before that, that you have to learn a certain amount of information every day for maybe 18 years. Um, and, and, and just based on your knowledge of lang language acquisition and, and, and computing and language acquisition, what, what, what do you think about the idea that, that you know, you could, you could become fluent in three months in a language or that... You know, I'm, I'm, I don't want to name any specific names, but, you know, there are companies out there, you know, big companies who, who are selling products, you know, where they claim that you could learn a language in, in five minutes a day. I mean, how, how do you, as a scientist, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it, it depends on what exactly you mean by learning a language. So um, I'm sure you, you, you could learn something useful in five minutes a day, um, probably not fluent, right, unless you spent a really long time. Kids spend hours and hours a day for, uh, for a decade or two trying to, to figure out how their language works. So um, uh, at the same time, right, like you, you could probably acquire something. Um, and so it's a, it, it's, a, it's a question of kind of what level of confidence you'd, you'd like to achieve. I, I wanted to ask you about something else, which was in, in, the, world of, in the world of language learning, there's, there's a lot of um, teachers who, who insist on their students immediately thinking in, in, in the language they're trying to learn. So if you're French and you're trying to learn English, your teacher will probably say to you, okay, 
I want you to think in English. And um, <laughs> I'm curious about your, your, your take on this, because I know that you've done some research about, you know, the language of thought. And, and, and what, what do you think about uh, um, sort of um, suggesting that somebody could s think in a particular language? Yeah, so um, uh, this is a, a, a sort of big unknown in terms of uh, cognitive psychology is, is what is the language that we think in? Mm -hmm. And um, there's some people that think, like, there's some people that, that hypothesize that uh, the language we think in uh, is natural language. So, so when we have thoughts, they're underlyingly uh, whatever maybe was our first language or our most frequently used language or something. Um, there's other people who hypothesize that there's a separate language, that there's some kind of mental ease um, that supports, you know, reasoning and, and that, that that mental ease in some sense has to get translated into the language that we speak. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and there's other people who think that, that there's, there's like, it's not even right to talk about mental languages, that there is no language of thought, um, that um, there's some other kinds of, of representations which don't look at all like language. So mm -hmm. what it means for something to look like a language is, is that uh, it has little pieces of meaning and you form complicated thoughts or ideas by piecing together those those little parts of meaning. Um, so a, a good analogy is like how an English sentence works or how a computer program works. Um, you can express a more complicated idea just by putting pieces together. And mm. th th that's not at all a uh, an established fact in cognitive psychology, I'd say. It's what, one of the more contentious and kind of debated points is uh, to, to, to what degree our, our uh, non-linguistic representations look like that to what degree they, they, they look like something where there's little pieces that are that are put together. Mm. Maybe there's some people out there who are thinking, well, I, I don't really I don't really need to learn a language because in the next ten years um, Google will have um, a little thing we can put in our ear and it will have automatic translation between any language in the world and um, you know what's the point of, of learning a language? I mean how, how, how far away do you think we are from that? Do you think it will ever happen? Will it happen in 10 years? I mean... Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, the, um, uh, I think that the tools that exist now are, are pretty good. So um, you can go to a country where you don't speak the language and get around pretty well with uh, Google's Translate. You know, you have to type in what you want to say or something. But, um, um, you know, I, I think that the... Um, the you know in the ear thing that automatically translates um, is is not that far of a leap of technology. I mean the speech recognition systems there are, are there. Um, the translation systems are are pretty good, um, and so I think that that if if you're interested in um, you know just navigating from the airport to your hotel and then going to buy dinner or something, that that, that, that that's essentially already a solved problem, I think. Yeah. Um, if you yeah, want to engage right. in a real conversation uh, about some, you know, some topic in depth with somebody, then I think it's it's a bit harder because I think the translation systems have to be a bit better and they have to handle, um, uh, you know, unusual topics a bit better than they, they actually do. Um, so I, d I don't know how long. I, I mean, um, I think it, it depends on, a, on sort of how, how good it has to be. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, to, well, to... I mean, obviously you're, you're a person who's, who's interested in language because you've spent your whole career since you, well, since you started university, you've spent your whole career working yeah. in language. And, and I mean, how, how does that on an emotional level, on a personal level, I mean, what do yeah. you think of the idea, what do you think of the idea of people maybe not really needing to learn languages? I mean, is that exciting to you, to you or do you think that's kind of sad, you, you know? Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, I fall uh, a little, well, I, I'd say it's a little bit of both, right? So um, if, you know, I don't speak Japanese, for instance, but if, if there was a great tra translation tool that would let me, you know, travel easier in Japan and in, engage with more kind of natural Japanese content, then great. Um, <laughs> that, that seems like a, a great thing. Um, at, at the same time, I mean, I think that there's a, a lot of value in um, uh, sort of engaging deeply with a, another culture, and, and part of that is, is often trying to, to learn the language and, and understand it. Um, so I think that um, uh, from from that point of view, like there's there's real knowledge to be gained for individuals in in learning languages, um, but at the same time, it's also 
like very convenient <laughs> to have good good tools that let you let you do things. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. when when I spoke to 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 Daniel Everett about about this topic. I sort of asked yeah. him, I asked him like, why, you know, why, why should people learn languages? Like what's, what's the point, you know, because for, for a lot of people, you know, you're in your country, maybe you travel for two weeks a year, but you know, you're, you're not doing business. You have no real necessity to, to learn a language. And, and he said that, um, you know, in, in the past language was taught as a different way to view the world. Language was taught as a different way to think. You know, I know this is more more personal opinion than science, but you know, what what do yeah. you think is is the point of learning a language, really? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I think that that's uh, that's basically right. I, I I wouldn't say it's necessarily a different way to think. That's actually a whole a whole other <laughs> unknown debate in, in kind of psychology and other people who speak different languages think and think differently in some fundamental way. Um, but I, I, I certainly think it's um, it's an important part of of understanding a, a, a different culture and um, anything that that gets you out of. Um, you know, only knowing about the one culture that, that you grew up in, I think, is, is very important. Um, so I, I guess I, I, I see it as just a kind of piece of, uh, of learning about the world and learning about the universe and, other, and how other people live and, and these kind of things. I'm aware that, that you know, second language learning and, and classroom learning is not your, not your area of expertise. But, you know, if you... If, if, I'm going to ask you anyway. <laughs> I mean, what, <laughs> okay. what, what, what would you do? Do you have any advice for for anybody who's trying to learn a language? Maybe there's so, something which you feel like could be solid advice for for people who who really want to to get fluency. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think immersion, and I I, I think. Uh, Really forcing yourself to engage with the language as opposed to using these other uh, these other ways of getting around things uh, probably helps a lot. So you know if if you're visiting a country and and you could buy a train ticket by pointing at something, <laughs> right? That's not going to help you learn the language. If you force yourself to to try to speak it, um, then uh, maybe you'll say something incorrect. But you know people are are very robust to uh, communicating successfully with someone who doesn't quite have the right grammar or quite have the right pronunciation. So. Um, I think that, that people feel often feel very self-conscious about making mistakes, and um, that, that that's that's something that you know if you're really trying to learn the language, you should just try to ignore as best you can. <laughs> yes, uh, l the language learning process is is mostly making mistakes, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. Mo making mistakes, looking stupid, um, but but <laughs> you're right. Well, um, well, it's it's been a fascinating conversation. Um, I, I'm sure yeah, that I, I would love to talk to you all day, but but I, I know you're a busy man, um, so I'm I'm just going to to leave it here and and thank you very much for your time. Cool, thank thank you very much. I'm happy to talk. Thank you, Thanks. thank you, sir. <laughs>